Now, I normally do this talk, or I do a lot of the time to uh, schools. So a little bit of the background to the coal industry in South Wales is quite important. And we start with a picture of a mid-Victorian uh, sailing ship. This is Cutty Sark, actually, about 1860s. Uh, sail, mostly made of wood, masses of them about. But if we move on 40 years or so to the turn of the 20th century, that's a ship of about that time. It is massively different. It's hugely different from the Cutty Sark. Steam powered, burning coal. And Britain at that time, by 1900, was the center of a worldwide, a global empire with ships sailing to and from Britain to every corner of the world. So a ship might typically go from Liverpool to somewhere like Calcutta in India or Singapore. Put that on. And early Victor uh, early or late Victorian steamships of the old days weren't as efficient as they became later. And they needed coal. They needed lots of it. Um, a ship going from Britain to the Far East or even to India generally couldn't get there on one load of coal. And um, a port like Aden set up at the bottom of the Red Sea became a coaling port where ships could take on more coal to finish the last leg of the journey or fill up with coal to come back. And that developed a big trade of exporting coal from South Wales, from the ports of South Wales to places like Aden. And of course, we've got the uh, legacy of that with the black community we have in Butte Town in Cardiff here, um, which were originated with people who got jobs as stokers on the ships and came back to Cardiff and settled here. It's one of the earliest black communities in Europe, in fact. So South Wales steam coal was some of the best available anywhere in the world. It was quite gassy. Uh, it burnt with a hot flame and it was exported worldwide. Masses went to for the uh, steam in uh, for shipping. Also, masses went for railways, for industrial steam engines, all sorts of things. But let's come a bit closer to home now. And that's an early map of the South Wales coal field, which went pretty well, way beyond Clanethley and the west. But in the middle of the coal field was the steam coal. And some of the thickest and the best seams were in the Rhonda Valley. So that was that's what became exported much sought after worldwide. Uh, a more modern map with the M4 on it. Let's have a look at the Rhonda Valley. Let's put it on there. Two Rhonda rivers coming down, joining at Porth and joining the Taff at Pontypridd, as we all know. Basically, coal went downhill to Cardiff and Barry and Newport. And that was a big advantage in late Victorian times when steam trains weren't all the locomotives pulling the coal weren't very powerful. They didn't have to drag it uphill. But business interests in the Swansea Bay area, well, they wanted a slice of the action. They wanted to export some of the coal from their ports. They could see the boom that was going on in the Rhonda. So they would have to take coal by this route to Baglan, Port Talbot, Neath, Britain Ferry, and of course Swansea itself. They were all coaling ports in those days, because although Swansea is the only one that is a port nowadays. So the next slide is a view looking down the top of the Rhonda Valley, looking more or less in this direction towards the Swansea Bay 
area. It's a sort of 3D view. So this is looking down at the top of the Rhonda Valley. That is um, Treherbert to Neweth. Um, and you've got the two Ron, uh, blind Rhonda up here and blind Cum up here. And looking over the top, Swansea is in that direction or Swansea Bay is in that direction. You can see from this a bit of a quite a good view of the geography of the land or the lie of the hills and you've got a high plateau surrounding the head of the Rhonda Valley so to get coal down to the Swansea Bay they're going to have to dig a tunnel through that that um, plateau a long tunnel would be essential but where would they put it Uh, now, we've got a lot of history, you know, a fair bit about the tunnel from two books which are in the National Archive in Kew in London from the engineers. Uh, I think it's Samuel Herbert Yockney and Son to the board of the Rhonda and Swansea Bay Railway starting in 1880 going through to about 1891. But there's a monthly progress report which really tells us a lot about how the tunnel was built. They are lovely books to read, beautifully written, uh, as easy as anything to read today, in fact, as they ever were. And they considered various routes we can see from these books. Uh, so if you know the top of the Rhonda Valley, you've got Treherbert here, Triorchy, and you've got the Avon Valley, which goes down to Port Talbot here. So they looked at going from Blind Rhonda to Glencorug, that was one route they considered. Then Blind Cum to Blind Gwynfi. And also going from Cum Park through the hill there to Abergwynfi. That's the one they eventually choose, chose, Blind Cum to Blind Gwynfi. Now, in Victorian times, they didn't have any tunneling machines. Um, like we see today, these great big sort of uh, screw machines that you sort of screw their way through the hill. Um, they had to do a lot of the digging by hand with pick and shovel, although they did use um, di uh, explosives in the Rhonda Tunnel quite a bit later on. But the way the Victorians would build a railway tunnel would be to build a line of construction shafts along the line of the tunnel. So this tunnel's got two. And in this tunnel, you can have six gangs of navvies working, building the tunnel simultaneously. So you can have one, two, three, four, five. Oh dear, sorry, excuse me. Let's go back a bit. Ah, I'm clicking the, let's try that again. Right. There was someone for you, something for you to edit out. Uh, so in this tunnel, you can have six gangs of navvies working simultaneously. One, two, three, four, five, six. That means you can make much, for, much quicker progress. Rhonda Tunnel was too deep to use this method. They had to dig from both ends and meet in the middle. Um, we'll come up, say a bit more about that later on in the talk, but that was something that made it rather special. It took rather longer to dig because of that. So a narrow tunnel was built and subsequently widened out. And we've got this remarkable picture taken in about 1885, 86 of some bigwigs being taken into the tunnel. I expect the Earl of Jer uh, Jersey was one of these people. He was the chair of the Rhonda and Swansea Bay Railway. We think this is Yockney, who was the tunnel engineer. Knowing how muddy it can get down there, I have no idea how many should get, that, get there without getting mud all over him, but there we are. But this was the narrow tunnel being built, which would have loved, subsequently been widened out and lined. This is almost certainly at Blind Gwynvy, uh, yeah, Blind Gwynvy at the far side of the tunnel at the Avon Valley. 
and see the, the, the roof supported with timber at this point. So we've got reports on progress. So tunnel start, tunneling started at Blind Gwynvy in the Avon Valley. It was delayed in Blind at this end, at the Rhonda end, because of a land ownership issue with the Butte Estate. The Butte Estate, the Earl of Butte, uh, you probably know, owned large amounts of land in which coal was found. And he built Cardiff docks and became really the 19th century equivalent of an oil baron and one of the richest people anywhere in the world. Um, so his estate wasn't too keen on on um, a tunnel going, taking his coal away down to Swansea instead of Cardiff. So he wasn't too keen on speeding it up. But they did start about six months after the uh, work started on the far side in the Avon Valley. Uh, by 1887, the reports are monthly reports in the uh, to the the board of the railway company were fairly optimistic. But by 19, 1888, we see starting to see complaints about progress, uh, delays, unnecessary delays, problems with wet weather, frost, pumps not working, etc., and so on. And they're also by this at this time drilling through hard pennant sandstone, which is a pretty tough, hard rock, um, which slowed progress much more than or rather more than they'd expected. But actually is one of the reasons why the tunnel survived so well. It's got a it's in very solid rock. By 1889, you've got quite a lot of dissatisfaction with the contractor the tunnel contractor, a company called William Jones of Neath, say, complaining about inadequate manpower, unnecessary delays, inadequate machinery, and of course the hard rock slowing progress. But on the 16th of March, 1889, at 2300 hours, five to midnight, the two ends of the tunnel met in the middle. I have a bit more again to, to say about that in a minute as well. However, a month, just a month later, there was a crisis meeting with the contractor. The uh, railway company were getting very, were getting rather fed up with the slow progress because it was it had started in March 1886. This was now uh, three years later, and. In May 1889, William Jones of Neath was sacked and replaced by a company called Lucas and Aird. Uh, Lucas and Aird were a company, a uh, big national, a UK-wide railway builder, railway contractor, a bit like a company like Balfour Beatty, with a sort of lots of um, play, well known for that sort of construction. Um, big, big company. Anyway. They gave workers a pay rise to ease a shortage of labor and built extra housing for them. Because we have to remember that in 1889 or that period of time, this was really quite a boom for uh, the coal mining industry in the Rhonda. And people were flocking there to get jobs in the mines. And the tunnel railway tunnel builders were basically looking for skilled miners effectively because building a still building a tunnel and um a rail and a coal mine are much the same thing um so they were competing against a lot of mines that were opening up and doing good business and i think william jones of neath wasn't actually paying quite enough this uh, so lucas and Aird paid a bit more and, and eased the situation uh, seven workers died during construction, and that was actually considered quite an achievement at that time. Um, so, I don't know. We wouldn't consider that very good nowadays. Anyway, in May 1890, Colonel Rich, the Board of Trade Inspector, was invited to approve the line. The tunnel failed inspection 
because 753 yards were left unlined. No brick lining in the tunnel. By that time, they'd built quite a few tunnels, uh, particularly over in the east of England, where the rock is generally much softer and, and younger. And they'd had instances where bits of rock had fallen off onto trains or onto the, the track. And it was considered unsafe uh, to leave tunnels unlined. Um, tunnels built before that do, do have sections without any lining in them. But this way, he insisted that they put a brick lining in. So the Ronda and Swansea Bay Railway decided not to open the line until the 753 yards of roof had been lined with stone. And they completed it in just six weeks. And Colonel Rich came along and declared the line fit to open. But by that time, they were desperate to get it open. So if you see the headstone above the tunnel as it stood at the, this end, at the Ronda end, it says Ronda and Swansea Bay Railway, Ronda Tunnel, length 3,443 yards, opened by blank. Nobody there. July 1890. They were in such a rush to open it. They never did have a get, get anyone along to formally open it. They just opened it to traffic the next day. So that was all part of its sort of odd history. Oh, now this is a, um, a picture of the book reporting the um, progress with the tunnel to the board of the Swansea, Ronda and Swansea Bay Railway. Uh, and I've highlighted, this was the letter that was written when they declared that the tunnel, the two ends of the tunnel had met. And I've highlighted a little bit, which makes it very easy to read. The lines were found to be absolutely correct. And the levels at the junction where the two ends met, when they were digging from both ends, agreed to within half an inch. Now, if you think about how that had to be done, they had to survey right over the top and then down through the other end, and then back into the tunnel to get the two lines together and uh, exactly the right height and just an error of half an inch. That was an amazing feat of engineering at the time. That was really quite something very special. It's much easier nowadays with the sort of lasers and all the sort of modern tools we've got. But in those days, they weren't quite as, as simple as that. Uh, here's a couple of pictures from 1890. Sidney William Yockney, who was the chief engineer. I think we saw a picture of him earlier on. No. And that's a picture of the tunnel um the blind portal in 1890 it looked pretty similar to that until the 19 the end of the 1960s a uh, couple of footnotes to the construction of the tunnel uh the worst accident was in january 1889 when two men were killed in a roof fall while blasting. I think they just didn't get back in far enough away from the, uh, the blast and some shrapnel uh, hit them. William Jones of Neath, the original tunnel contractor, who was sacked, he was sacked from building it and sued the Ronda and Swansea Bay Railway for £10,000 for breach of contract when the company was replaced by Lucas and Aird. Uh, in 1897, the matter was resolved in the High Court in London. There's a great book, 250 handwritten pages long, outlining the judgment. I only actually read the last four or five pages because I was running out of time. But... William Jones and company were awarded just £220. They didn't do very well out of that. Uh, some pictures of the early life of the Ronda Tunnel. 
Oh, yes. Oh, no. Yeah, no, no, I'll come to that in a minute. Now, coal going to Cardiff or Barry for export still uh, went downhill. We've pointed that out earlier. But coal to the Swansea Bay ports went uphill as far as the tunnel and slightly uphill in the tunnel. But towards the top of the Ronda, there was a section of one in 55 gradient uphill. It later became known as the tortuous climb. It frequently required double headers. Um, Steve Mackey, chair of Ronda Tunnel Society, he lived just below the, the cutting where it, uh, under the embankment where the trains were. And as a small boy, he used to come out and see what happened. Sometimes the trains would get about two thirds of the way up there, just up above his house, and they would stall. They'd have to back all the way back down to um, Blind Rod or even beyond, put a bit more coal on the fire to get a bit more steam up and try again at it. And he said he learned some very interesting, uh, mainly about English doing that when he was when he was a small boy, when the crews train stalled but that's life it made exporting coal to swansea bay more expensive than taking it out via cardiff or barry or even newport so mm -hmm. the bulk of coal continued to go down to cardiff or barry and by 1906, the Great Western Railway was operating the Ronda and Swansea Bay line. And then in the reorganization after the First World War of 1923, it just took over the, the company. A couple of pictures of between the wars. That's a scene during wet weather. Now, I have to say, I've been in there, been wet weather the last year or so. It doesn't look very different now. Uh, there are a few changes, but you can see just pretty well as much water going in now. And then cold weather. Got this mass of icicles. I'm told that what they did um, before sending uh, a diesel train through, a diesel, D DMU, diesel multiple unit, the sort of trains rather like we have nowadays the pacers and the sprinters with a windscreen at the front they would send a steam locomotive through to knock all the um, icicles off the roof so that it, it, none of them came down and went through the windscreen right. but let's have a look at some of the problems that emerged in the life of the tunnel so the ronda tunnel this is a, a sort of section through the tunnel here's the tunnel it's only got one air shaft at the Bl Avon Valley, uh, Blind Gwyn V end, not very far from the entrance. And there's a big mountain over the top. In fact, it was about almost at the deepest point, almost a thousand feet below the um, surface, the, 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 the top of the mountain. And it was about 300 or meters or a thousand feet above sea level. And there were coal seams around there. There was one above and two coal seams below. I'm, I'm told that when you worked what some of these uh, these seams, you could hear the trains rumbling above you. And due to subsidence, uh, the Ronda end is now about 40 centimeters or one foot three lower than it was when it was first opened. Or, uh, and it caused the subsidence caused a bit of problems, a bit of leakage where you saw water coming in and they put some ribs, steel ribs in there. I'll show you them in a minute to um, protect the trains from any loose masonry, loose, any loose material that fell off the roof. Also, it went through a geological fault about two thirds the way through and Basically, they found that that. Uh, oh, here, right, yes. I'll stop. I'll come back to that in a minute. Right, these are the ribbed sections that they put in in the 1930s and the 1950s. These are basically just railway rails bent into a curve.
and a report from the chief engineer of British Railways Western Region of 1951 said that to keep the tunnel open, no more coal should be mined from near the tunnel. And he also said that this would result in the loss of nearly a million pounds spread over approximately the next 100 years. 2021 is just 70 years on from that. And um, I think things have changed a bit. Because the best place for that coal, quite honestly, with all the threat of climate change, is for it to stay in the ground. Um, Anyway, in 1968, just where the tunnel passes through a geological fault, they discovered some distortion in the roof. And this is a remarkable picture of it. They went through on a diesel engine. And these are the engineers. Um, this one's not even wearing a hard hat, but there are. Uh, and they found that the, the roof of the tunnel had been quite a bit distorted, so they decided that they would basically need to close it. And to protect the roof and stop it collapsing, they decided they would put a cog or a coog in there, which is well, well known in the mining industry, to protect the roof. Great big heavy timber structure to protect the roof uh, and stop it collapsing while they found the money to repair the tunnel. And there it is today, still there. I uh, have a bit more to say about that in a minute, or in a video that we're doing about it. But by 1970, the decision was taken to close the whole line rather than to find the money to repair the tunnel. The tracks were taken up soon after. The tunnel approach cuttings were filled in. There's one of the approach cuttings. This is the cutting at Blind Cum being filled in. There's the headstone. They built this, this air shaft in front of it. And when they filled it in completely, there things rested. Now, next few slides. Um, I've taken, I've taken the, the one, the more recent ones, in fact, but I've tried to take pictures from the same location as they were taken originally. So this is uh, Blind Grinvy on the far side of the tunnel. This is in the 1960s. You can see the tunnel here. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see the railway line. And now I've taken a photo of roughly the same shot location and we'll merge it in. It's a very different scene today. And we'll go back to the original. You can see some of these houses are still there. One or two have been demolished. It's a bit difficult to get them perfectly lined up. So quite a change. One of the things to notice is just how much the valleys have changed they were very bare lots of bare wood uh, hillside in those days now they're covered in a lot more vegetation a lot more trees so that's something to look out for right this is looking down the avon valley we've got the date on this one 1969 again rather bare hills the tunnel is down the bottom on the bottom right here there were two railways up the valley in those days and see what that looks like. So it's interesting to see just how much things have changed. Trees, much more trees. Um, roads, this road was completely new. These houses are new. Go back to the original. So quite a lot of change uh this one is oh this is the ronda side this was <coughs> mid 70s um 
tunnels been closed. Tracks have been taken up, but the track bed's still here. Let's see what that looks like. Well, it's actually moved on a bit from that since then. But let's see what that looked like a couple of years ago. No trace of the railway. What's appeared here is three little trees at the top. They actually mark the line of the tunnel under the mountain. Let's go back to the original. Oh, now look how the mountain hasn't really changed very much. That's That still looks much the same, but at ground level, everything's completely different. And going back to Blind Gwynvy, this is a this is mid 70s color photo. Um, tracks have been taken up. The tunnel's got a sort of barrier ab above it. Oh, the one air shaft is just here. And the line of the tunnel is marked by this um, bare hillside, the, the line where there's no trees. Swap to what that looks like today. Very different again. And again, the houses are these houses. These houses are here, still here. Go back to where we were. Trees had all been planted by this time, but of course they they were still quite small. Oh, when they when they filled this approach cutting in this coal tip here, most of that was emptied down into that into the cutting so the, that's that's what fills this place up when we open it up again it'll all, all have to be excavated out again last photo is the view from the top of the hill looking down the Rhonda valley this is blindcom village again mid 60s you can see the railway line going down to tenueth treherbert Tre triorki beyond you've got the hook and eye colliery um Glen Rondo, isn't it? What another colliery down here? Um, let's see what that looks like now. Blind Cum Village is more or less the same. Colliery's gone there. Tinuous, I think there's been a few more houses built, but again, much more hillsides covered and much more trees this was one of the trees that, the, that was planted at the top to mark the line of the tunnel and in fact just down here that little uh slab that little white speck i don't know if you can see that that actually marks the that is the um air shaft the hatch over the air shaft where we go in so the tunnel was was there more or less There we are, go back to the original photo. But when the tunnel was filled in, the approach cuttings were filled in, the headstone at Blind Cum went missing. But very fortunate it did. It was found by the same person who had written please open me in 1971. Uh, he was, he'd lost his job. This was about 2013. He'd lost his job and was very depressed coming up towards retirement. Um, went for a long walk and found by, he was down by Clinapier and found um, a, a big stone under a great big uh, bramble thicket. Uh, and went and investigated, and there it was. It was this missing headstone. So he got it, mo it moved to a stonemason in uh, Tri Triorki and got it repaired because it got a crack on it. And basically, they got it put up at Treherbert Station. It was the person who is now the chair of the Ronda Tunnel Society, Steve Mackey. He'd written that. As a 13-year-old boy, he says that someone sort of hung him over the, the, the edge of the tunnel to write his name there. Um, 
But anyway, that, that his losing it and refinding it's part of the history of the, the, the tunnel. So when they reopen, uh, re uh, unveil the headstone at Trio, uh, Treherbert Station, the Ron, there was a lot of demand to do more than just um, restore the headstone. They, a lot of people said, well, why don't we reopen the whole tunnel? And the Rhonda Tunnel Society was formed to do that. And soon afterwards, there was the first inspection for about 40, 45 years. It was found to be in surprisingly good condition. Uh, you know, if they'd found any collapses in it, I think that would have been the end of it. And that, that's it. But they didn't. There was no, hadn't collapsed at all. And also, very important, there were no bats in the tunnel. Because bat, bat, bats are, are bad news for civil engineers. Let me tell you that. Uh, the Welsh government paid for a, a survey in 2016. And the ecologists tried very hard to find some, but they didn't. This was a uh, tunnel entry. Oh, this, this is um, Leanne Wood going into the tunnel. I don't know if she's an MS anymore. And we don't know whether she, well, we'll have to see what happens after Friday. But she went in in 2017. This is the way you have to go in at the moment at Blind Grinfy. You're lowered down the air shaft. It's about 60 feet down. Uh, you're sitting in a harness. And these, these team from... Uh, Mines Rescue or MRSL are down at Porth. They manage the whole thing. They're very good. They're, they're very professional. You feel very safe doing that. So we're planning to take a number of um, other people in this July. So that'll be a next event that we're working towards. Anyway, in 2017, a 90,000 pound grant was obtained from the Pennycomoyth Wind Farm Community Fund to pay for a detailed examination. And that was done by Balfour Beatty in April and May 2019, uh, 2018, three years ago now. So I'm going to show a short video that was made during that uh, three years ago now, which gives you some idea of what's inside, what was done then, what the tunnel looks like. So let's, let's crack on with that. The valleys of South Wales, now unrecognisable from the stereotypical image of the area that encapsulated its former life as an industrial hub. The villages hereabouts were built on coal, a mineral wealth which brought riches for some and employment for many. There was pride and community spirit. Mining's demise did wonders for the landscape, erasing its blackened scars, but the social and economic wounds have been slower to heal. The loss of rail links built originally to serve the pits didn't help. Rhonda Tunnel connected Blindcum to Blindgwynvy, two miles on the train but 11 via a mountain pass that's glorious in the summer but winter weather can make treacherous. The tunnel was closed in 1968 and buried a decade or so later. Could its reopening for walkers and cyclists improve connectivity, boost tourism and create jobs? It's an idea promoted by a campaign group, the Rhonda Tunnel Society based locally, but with far-reaching support. It has big ambitions. There's going to be an information centre, possibly a cafe or a restaurant. Uh, there's going to be bike hire. Uh, there's going to be disabled buggies. Uh, there's going to be a bus running across the, the Rikos. Uh, there's going to be car parks. So this is going to show this place for what it is. Little Switzerland, as uh, Richard Burton said. You'll also see probably quite a few more B&Bs springing up in Blind Grinfy and on the other side in Blind Cum. Uh, the shops will reopen, pubs will reopen, restaurants reopen. This is what we want to see. Put a bit of life back into the, into the communities. Whilst the tunnel's reopening has many champions, there are substantial hurdles to overcome. Who would own it and what condition is it in after 50 years redundancy? 
The most likely custodians are the Welsh Government or two local authorities, but they won't make commitments without clear insight into the extent of the liabilities, the repairs needed and their likely cost. That's why engineers from Balfour Beatty have spent six days in the tunnel, carrying out a tactile examination of its lining. We look for, uh, firstly, the obvious losses of section, uh, what we engineers call spalling, which is uh, piece, pieces of masonry or brickwork that is uh, broken away, usually through uh, either movement within uh, the barrel itself or through uh, freeze thaw action. In the hodge. And then to the, the listening part of that would be to ensure the soundness of the masonry and brickwork. So uh, we have um, large pieces of metal that we hit things with, very simplistically. Um, and uh, if, it, uh, if it bounces off, it's very good. If it makes a dull thud, you might be slightly worried. If it sounds like a drum, there is definitely some separation. Ronda Tunnel was driven in the late 1880s, its construction beset by delay and contractual wrangle. 130 years later, most of it still appears in good condition, although mine workings and water ingress prompted defects to emerge through the eastern half of the tunnel, steel ribs then being inserted to provide additional support. Some sections were originally so flawless that the engineer left them unlined, only for the Board of Trade inspector to voice his objections concrete and brickwork soon brought his approval. And then there's the cog, a timber construction occupying the full profile of the tunnel at a point where a hinge has developed at the high haunch. Its role was to resist any further distortion of the lining, although there's no evidence it ever did so. No part of it actually makes contact with the stonework, which is just as well. Some of the timber today is hollow and rotten. I've walked two miles from one end of this tunnel to the other. I've seen examples of Victorian engineering, very high quality work, innovation. This must be one of the very earliest tunnels with uh, concrete. I've seen a tunnel in extremely good condition. Yes, there's a few defects. Yes, there's some areas where there's going to be some masonry repairs, the steel arches are in there, and there's some water ingress. But there's nothing that I would see here that can't be solved. That said, restoring Ronda Tunnel for public use will not be cheap. There's much to do, both inside and out. But the society is clear, the benefits will outweigh the costs and it's developing a business case to prove it. The big question is whether those in authority can see the vision and have the courage to support it. Looking at the long-term plan, a few years from now, this could become a real hot spot for tourism and actually that'll benefit the wider valleys. So I think if you, if you just think of how unique this is, and the selling attraction for the area, I think it's something that we should definitely be backing. Come on, old Chris, don't be shy. There'll be a verdict on whether to back it after the engineering and financial evidence has been collated and considered. But if first impressions count, there is certainly cause for optimism.